I'm Rob Trasinski. This is Symposium, where we talk about, uh, have conversations about the nature of a liberalism in a free society. My guest today is Dalibor Rohak, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, the author of In Defense of Globalism, and an expert on democratic backsliding in Eastern Europe. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, the, the reason I wanted to have you, um, I've been following your stuff for a long time, but the, the, the sort of immediate reason I wanted to have you on is because there's been a series of conservatives in America trooping off to Eastern Europe recently, to Hungary, <laughs> to you know, most prominently Tucker Carlson, going out there and proclaiming this as a model for the US, a model for the kind of conservatism that they want. Uh, and so I wanted to talk to you about what is the current state of Hungary? They, they, and they, one of the things they're saying is, you know, this is a perfectly free society, it's just one that's more in line with uh, conservative values. So basically what I wanted to start with is, yeah, what is the state of Hungary? How free is the political system in Hungary? Well, um, that's a great question. Uh, Hungary is obviously among those countries that transitioned more or less successfully away from the totalitarian regimes uh, that that ruled over Central and Eastern Europe for 40 years since the end of the Second World War. Um, for a long time, uh, since the 1990s, Hungary, as well as Poland and the other Visegrad countries were considered a sort of success stories. And and I think as late as in mid noughties most political scientists would argue that uh, de-democratization was almost unthinkable. You know, a few electoral cycles in with well-structured party systems, it was very hard to imagine that these countries would sort of revert back to, to some form of authoritarian rule. Um, now, now, you, you used the term there, just want to make sure that, that people follow this. You called them the Visegrad countries. Yes. And this is this sort of group of Central European, uh, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. Yes, uh, that's the Visegrad Four, which together with the Baltic states joined uh, the EU in 2004, to be followed by Romania and Bulgaria a few years later, and later by Croatia. And, and, and so the point is that uh, what is happening in some of these countries is not so much uh, a backsliding, a sort of reversal back to communist era uh, totalitarianism, but it's rather uh, the creation of a, of a new hybrid sort of political system, particularly in Poland and, and Hungary, where you do have elections, where there is a degree of party competition and where there is also a significant extent of, of incumbent entrenchment on the part of these uh, self-styled nationalist or conservative or populist forces. And this form of entrenchment you know, doesn't really involve jailing dissidents or, 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 or erecting you know, barbed wires on the borders to keep people from emigrating, rather you know, it's the other way around where Orban has, has been very successful at leveraging the 2015 refugee crisis to, to, to sort of keep, keep asylum seekers out and, and also instilling fear in the Hungarian electorate about the sort of masses that were going to overrun, overrun Hungary. Um, it's, it's a sort of softer version of, of, of authoritarian rule that, that in, involves, uh, you know, redrawing the rules of the political game in a way that makes it very difficult for opposition to have a shot at winning elections. Uh, it involves concentrating power over media, over various nominally independent uh, agencies of the government and using them for, for political aims. And that's something that really has been going on uh, in Hungary for over a decade and, and, and less so in, in, in Poland since 2015. All right. So the, the phrase you used there now, you, you wrote a, a very you sent me a very interesting report you've recently published about sort of comparing the Czech system to the Hungarian system. And, and one of the 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 phrase, one of the phrases that keeps popping up there is incumbent entrenchment. And I think that's mm -hmm. an interesting concept. So it's not that you have you know complete totalitarian control, it's that you rig it the game so that it is the the so that the incumbents, whoever's in power, has so many levers of power over the system that he basically makes it impossible for anyone to compete with him. So it's entrenching the incumbents. That's right. Uh, but I mean, before I sort of talk about that in, in, in a little bit more detail, I think it's worth saying that 
uh, these post-communist countries are not all different. I think there is very often a degree sort of, of, of almost casual orientalism that <laughs> permeates debates over post-communist countries in the West. Uh, I mean, these countries are actually different. N- not all of them suffer from, from, from the sort of incumbent entrenchment or de-democratization of the sort you see, you see in Hungary. Uh, you look at a country like Estonia, where corruption levels would be... Uh, you know, among the lowest in the entire European Union, which in many respects Estonia would resemble more Nordic states than than other post-communist countries. So, so there is a lot of variation between post-communist countries, uh, including on 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 these metrics of of sort of you know quality of democratic institutions. Uh, yeah, and you, the paper, paper you wrote was specifically contrasting Hungary to the Czech Republic and some of the different decisions they made early on, and which I think we'll get to a little bit more later, some of the different decisions they made that produced helped produce, along with many other complicated factors, helped produce different a- outcomes. Yes, because in, you know, in all of these countries, uh, including also in the West, of course, you had populist parties, <laughs> you had people campaigning against you know, immigrants, you had Euroscepticism, you had, you know, all sorts of sort of, you know, shared sort of political turbulences over the past 15 years. And uh, only in a handful of those places, those turbulences resulted in, in a, you know, what could be called backsliding or de-democratization or sort of erosion of, 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 of democratic norms. And one thing that distinguishes Hungary from these other places uh, I argue in this paper that just came out earlier this week in European Political Studies is, uh, is, is a sort of incomplete nature of the transition in the 1990s. It was, at the time, it was sort of lauded as, as a successful example of a, of a sort of you know, frictionless evolution from a communist system into a democratic one where, where the communist elite essentially gave up, gave up power and enabled, you know, allowed for free elections and privatization of the economy, et cetera. Uh, but it was also one in which that communist elite also transitioned seamlessly into the new post-communist political system. So the Communist Party, which is the, or the Hungarian Workers' Party, renamed itself and became a sort of standard center-left social democratic party. Uh, and also, you know, for example, the, the creation of independent judicial institutions in Hungary in the 1990s was seen by many Hungarians as a way of entrenching communist era judges in positions of influence. You had a very activist constitutional court throughout the 1990s that was sort of handing down judgments that were very political. And it was against this background uh, that Fidesz, the party of Viktor Orban, campaigned throughout the, uh, throughout the noughties really uh, as you know, saying that our revolution and Viktor Orban, it's worth remembering, was, was a sort of student activist leader in the late 1980s, a very sort of vocal anti-communist voice, somebody who at the time seemed to have a real commitment to classical liberal principles. Uh, but, but, the, but his argument later on was, when he was in opposition, was that our revolution was hijacked by communists and former communists, and we have to actually complete that, 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 that change that was started in the late 19, 1980s. It was with this message that he won the 2010 election, had, you know, other factors playing into that, such as the financial crisis and, and various corruption scandals. And he arrived in office with this massive political mandate, which he then used to rewrite the constitution, rewrite the electoral laws, uh, put in place all sorts of uh, unconventional, shall we say, economic policies that helped create a system of patronage built around him and his political party. And that really transformed Hungary uh, in, a, in a pretty deep way compared to other post-communist countries that, that started from a similar starting point. Right. So one of the top, one of the other concepts you bring out in, in that paper is the idea of the importance of a discontinuity between the communist regime and the new regime. And there's a term that I think Americans are, are blissfully unaware of uh, called lustration. So I want you to explain that a little bit. <laughs> I, I got a kick out of this because I looked it up and to make sure it meant what I thought it meant, because uh, you know, we don't have this concept here in America, we haven't needed it. Um, it, it its origin actually is, comes from a, a Roman ritual purification uh, ceremony. Uh, but what is, what is lustration and what's the importance of that? Well, so, so- Post-communist countries, much like other countries that sort of recovered from, from extended periods of authoritarian rule, 
put in place various measures contributing to what is called transitional justice, you know, in a sort of way of like reckoning with the past and, and, and holding people from the past accountable. Um, so lacerations narrowly understood are, are, are sort of, you know, forms of scrutiny of people for whether they were part of the uh, either communist party elite or uh, communist secret police, which was actually a fairly large, sizable force in the nineteen and uh, in, in the years leading to to the fall of, of, of these communist communist regimes, and it was done differently in different places. Uh, you know, in, in the Czech Republic, for example, uh, members of, of of communist era secret police were bar, barred from uh, certain public offices, from certain offices of the of 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 of, of, of the state. Uh, also, the archives of the uh, of, of, of 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 the secret police were opened uh, to various extent to either researchers or, or, or the general public um, in the hope that sort of more transparency would, would essentially uh, strengthen the trust that people would have in that new democratic system. And one thing that actually distinguishes Hungary from other, uh, other countries of the region is that these measures uh, in Hungary were always very limited and very half-hearted and also subject to either change or political manipulation. You know, like once you have these communist sort of secret police archives, with, you know, lots of information on, on all kinds of people in the country, you know, that can be sort of used selectively by whoever is in power to either leak information, to discredit political opponents, etc. And, and you had scandals like that uh, occurring on a fairly, fairly regular basis in Hungary, unlike, for example, in the Czech Republic, where this, this whole process was, was managed quite quite competently in the in the 1990s. I, I can see how opening the files would make a big difference because that means that even if you don't ban somebody from office, somebody can go find out, you know, how, what were they involved in? What did they do? Uh, the damage to their reputation that might prevent yeah. them from getting back into office or getting I mean, it's, into it's, 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 it's very complicated though because the communist secret police would obviously collect information on people that were seen as potential candidates for, <laughs> for, for being collaborators. So in other words, you might be you might have been anti-communist, but they found out you were cheating on your wife, and that's there in the files, and that can be used against you. And and, and that's why they were maybe trying to get you on on their side, right? And, and so, so so you have to be very careful about how you handle that. And and there was there was you know there there was more thought that went into that in some countries than in others, and I think that played a not not an insignificant role in. Uh, really strengthening the legitimacy of these of these new democratic institutions. Now, the other thing that I've noticed is that the the, the continuity in regimes, I think, also applies a lot to the legal structure. Mm -hmm. That um, uh, well, I want to talk about the press because one of the things we I now you were part of a, a call that Shikadamia uh, organized uh, a couple of weeks ago that I found very illuminating. They had a couple, number of Hungarian. Uh, members, you know, journalists and politicians talking about this system. And the thing that really jumped out at me is the press system that they still had a tremendous amount of government involvement in the media. So when, when the wall came down, you went the transition from communism, that they didn't have a period where they say, okay, we're going to get the government totally out of media. We're going to have a full, you know, something equivalent to the First Amendment like we have in the United States. We're going to have privatization of media. It, there was still an extensive system of government licensing and of media being, if, if not outright government owned, of being very dependent on advertising from the government. Yeah. And, and it was like a continuity with the old communist system. You, you had the media was still very government controlled, but all they did was they shared the control between the different parties. Uh, and, and, and then that led to a situation where somebody could come in and say, no, we're not going to share control anymore. That's right. Um I think, I think one thing that's important for Americans to realize is that media markets in Central Europe, whether it's Hungary or the Czech Republic, are you know, very small. You have only 9 million Hungarian speakers living in Hungary. And, and so it's very hard to sort of sustain large media enterprises that would be you know, financially, uh, financially sound. And... Uh, irrespective of the fact that you know media and journalism have been sort of difficult to sustain financially even in the west with the, the rise of, of of the internet and social media and 
and so forth. So, so that's a challenge that uh, sort of media companies are facing uh, in, in, in Central Europe. Uh, for both print media and, and sort of broadcasters, uh, advertising revenue is, is very important. And in the sort of economy that Viktor Orban has created, uh, the government plays an increasingly more and more important role as a source of advertising revenue for, for media companies, either directly through you know, government just buying sort of ads or indirectly through companies that are in many ways connected to the government or to the ruling party, uh, you know, being important advertisers. And, and, and knowing they, they are sort of encouraged to buy ads in the, in the, in the media that's friendly to the regime and discouraged. <laughs> it allows exactly. them to know that you, you will not be regarded well if you buy ads in the other ones. Exactly. And it's also not very difficult, um, given the size of these, of these media companies, to actually uh, sort of concentrate the ownership of, of a significant sort of part of the media space in, in a small number of hands. So in Hungary, it happened, for example, uh, in 2015 or 16, that, that the main central left daily was bought up by, by a sort of shell company close to Fidesz, to the ruling party, and then just shut down from one day to another. Uh, since then, you know, through sort of various legal mechanisms, the journalists were able to sort of revive that magazine, that, that, that daily newspaper, Nef as, a, as an online publication only. Uh, but but what, you know, what used to be Hungary's New York Times was just sort of shut down from one day to another. And also the government had sort of plausible deniability. There was a sort of very complicated ownership structure in that, in that company that, that bought it and shut it down. Uh, they could also argue that actually that, that, uh, that newspaper was not really financially viable. Which was which is true of most printed <laughs> newspapers in the in the region. It's true. It's true of most media organizations. Um, the, the Atlantic lost ten million dollars last year. So, yeah, yeah. it's 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 the standard condition of the media industry. But it's um, but it sort of creates uh, a situation in which uh, you know, there is less than full media freedom in a in a, in, a, in 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 a country like like Hungary, together with the fact that. Uh, the government obviously controls the TV licenses and radio licenses, uh, has full control over public broadcasting, which is a sort of much more important thing in, in, in Europe than it is in the United States. You know, it's not just sort of, you know, it, it's something akin to the BBC rather than NPR right. and, 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 and so forth. So, uh, and, so and, one, and one of the solutions to the media, the problem with the media companies being small and, and unfinancially viable, one solution would be to have them be owned by or connected to larger international conglomerates like a European-wide media company. But of course, then you raise the specter of, oh, well, that's foreign interference. And, and there's been attempts to clamp down on that as well. Yes. Yeah, so, so that was the um, a recent debate in Poland that took place with over one of the few remaining independent news channels, TVN, which is owned by the US-based, uh, what is it called, Discovery, I think is the sort of yeah. conglomerate. Uh, and so, so actually the Polish government, uh, Polish parliament uh, passed a law, which hasn't been signed into law yet, which would ban foreign ownership of, 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 of TV channels. In the meantime, thanks to, you know, it, it all gets more complicated with the European Union and the fact that once you are allowed to sort of operate in one EU country, you can't really be stopped from operating other EU countries, that, that TV channel actually got a Dutch license and is able to sort of operate, get, get around that law. Uh, but it's not for a lack of effort on the Polish or Hungarian government's part that, 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 that there is still some, some freedom of media in these, in these countries. Now, the other aspect of this, of this dis lack of, uh, of, of discontinuity from the, the Soviet past is the fact that, that Hungary never really put in what we would think of in America as a system of checks and balances where you have you know, different independent uh, uh, aspects, uh, different independent parts of government that are able to stop each other and stop a majority. And they also have a, an odd proportional representation system, which basically allows a very small minor, small majority to act like a supermajority. Yes. I mean, the electoral system is, is an oddity. It's one that combines aspects of proportional representation. So there is a countrywide list that you vote for, but you also vote for candidates in specific um, constituencies. Uh, and, uh, and then there is a 
compensatory element, so to speak. So, so, so those that are cast in individual constituencies, which don't go towards the winning candidate, then get reallocated and recalculated in a very cumbersome, in a very cumbersome way. It's, it's a very complicated system, which nonetheless uh, means that, you know, if you have 45, 46 percent of the popular vote in an election, you are able to secure a two-third majority in parliament very easily. I mean, that's not a shocker to, to an American audience, right? Like that, that, that you can have that with first past the post system as well. Uh, but, but it sort of operates in a much more random way in right. Hungary. In, in, Amer have in America, it's a, it's a relatively small effect where it's like you can get an extra four or five percent. Uh, so, like in, if, you, if you look at like elections in Hungary before 2010, like in, in much of those elections, uh, I mean, that there was a real disconnect between between sort of popular vote and 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 and, and control of of seats in parliament. And Viktor Orban, what he did was that he actually sort of strengthened these disproportional attributes of of the electoral system in a way that made it impossible for for opposition, which I mean, Hungary always had a multi party system, made it impossible for opposition to. To, to, to essentially run more than one candidate in specific constituencies. And it took several electoral cycles for, for the opposition forces to actually realize that and get the act together. And in the uh, election next year, uh, there has been this extraordinary sort of coalition that was formed from the extreme right to the pro-Western center left, sort of you know, liberals, everybody in between, essentially agreeing on putting forward just one candidate in every constituency, because that's the only way they can conceivably uh, defeat Fidesz. They also, Orban, like gerrymandered the country in a way that makes it very difficult for, for, for the opposition to work together. Uh, but I mean, the good news is that, you know, it's not a completely sort of closed totalitarian system. The opposition still has avenues to, to push back. And, uh, you know, if current trends continue, it's, it's far from certain that that Orban and, and then his party will be will be reelected in, in next year's elections. Well, I want to talk about that in a second, but there's one other aspect of this sort of lack of checks and balances. You quote someone saying that that the um, Hungarian legislature has become a law factory. <laughs> and uh, tell yeah. me a little bit about what, what that means. I mean, it well, sounds good. It's a law factory, right? <laughs> it, well, it is a law factory in the sense that uh, the time between uh, proposals being submitted to parliament by government and and at the time when they are actually passed and, and 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 sort of signed into law tends to be very short and that's been true particularly under the sort of one party control of 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 of, of the legislature since 2000 and since 2010 where even the new constitution which was adopted in 2011 was just drafted by a small group within the ruling fidesz party and was was adopted on purely partisan partisan lines with none of the opposition uh, voting for, for, for the new constitution. So, so that's something that, um, you know, it's, it's a system in which winner takes all these days and, and, and that's contributing to, to the depolarization that has existed in Hungary, which in some ways predates, predates Orban's arrival in power. And, and I think that, that to me is the, is the really sort of the main factor driving this, the, the fact that you have these two sort of segments of, of, of not just Hungary's political life, but, but of sort of Hungary's population seeing each other as, as mortal enemies yeah, and, yeah. And, and not seeing themselves, each other as, as sort of legitimate contestants within, within the democratic system. Well, one aspect of that is, it, you know, I, I remember hearing for years of people, especially on the left here in America, complaining about how cumbersome it is to pass laws and how we've got uh, there's somebody wrote a book called The Frozen Republic about how they are. Our republic is all frozen up because it has all these arcane rules that are supposed to prevent the majority from getting what it wants. And, you know, if only we, we could clear that away and make it a lot easier to pass new laws. And this is sort of an example of be careful what you wish for. Uh, because the the system you create that makes it really easy to jam laws to the system, if it gets taken over by somebody else, it could be used to basically to railroad you. Um, but that strikes me as sort of the, the larger picture here is that you had sort of, you had a system never really established proper checks and balances and a proper uh, control checks on the majority, but it was in the hands of a sort of hated communist, hated and corrupt communist leftover. And then they lost control of it and it came into the power, it came into the hands of the people who were their sort of nationalist enemies. 
Yeah, so, so I, I suppose one difference between um, what's been happening in the US is that you had, I think, a sort of real sort of disintegration of the traditional sort of committee system within Congress and sort of rules of seniority and, and, and the way normally bills would be written in the past. Sort of that got replaced by, you know, like somebody in the speaker's office writing a, a, a piece of legislation and, 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 and sending it out at like five in the morning and then it gets to the floor, right? Like if, if, if you want to get something done. And, and, uh, and so that arguably is not the healthy way of, of sort of writing legislation. Um, obviously, Hungary never really had that sort of committee system to begin with after, after communism. Um, and also, unlike, say, the US system, I mean, legislation uh, in, in many of these countries is written primarily by the executive, right, by, by, by the government. So it is the government that comes to parliament with, with, with bills uh, that, that they want to sort of put forward. And, and it's really not in the power or, you know, like few members of parliament would have the actual capacity to write sort of complex, significant pieces of, of new legislation. So, uh, so control of parliament and control of government essentially results to in, in, in fairly sort of significant unchecked power over 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 new legislation. I mean that's true of, of many different countries, including the UK. Yeah. Um, but in the, so, in the in the Hungarian yeah. context, it, it just comes hand in hand with with the sort of erosion of 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 sort of any sense of restraint or or sort of commitment to democratic norms or even actual constitutional judicial review of legislation for you know compliance with with the sort of higher order uh yeah. legal and, and constitutional norms you know and it's always a danger i mean in the u.s we have certain congress there's a congressman who said recently that my his whole staff isn't built around legislating it's built around communications it's built around making him you know a star on social media and that sort of thing yeah and you know he has no staff devoted to actually analyzing or writing legislation and that indicates that what it means is this guy is going to be off you know making a making a show of himself on social media but it, as far as actually being a legislator, he's just going to be a rubber stamp for whatever comes down the pike from, from the leadership. Uh, so that's always a danger. Um, now, to round out the picture of Hungary, though, I want to talk about, you talked about the, uh, the economic system being sort of devolving towards a form of patronage, uh, where people are, countries are dependent on being connected in some way to the government. That's right. Um, so again, like, relatively speaking, compared to post-Soviet countries, so countries of the former USSR, Hungary was never part of the former USSR, uh, you, could, you could always argue that, that Hungary is, you know, a success story, right? It's, it's home to many large Western European or US companies uh, that, that, that use Hungary's advantageous geographic position uh, as a sort of, you know, they use, use the country and its workforce as, as, as a manufacturing base, you have, you know, in some extent, in some ways, it's, it's an extension of the Bavarian automaking industry. So, so, I mean, there is a healthy sort of private sector. There is entrepreneurship. Uh, there are lots of foreign companies doing business in Hungary, uh, not really complaining. I mean, they're not facing, you know, bad conditions or, or you know, uh, absence of, of, of rule of law or anything of that, of that kind. But there is also... A sort of segment of the domestic economy that is built around the ruling party, around you know the government itself, and increasingly also around uh, EU funds. So money that is coming to Hungary from the European Union. In per capita terms, Hungary is among the largest, if not the largest, recipient of of EU funds, uh, and those money, the, the, those those sources of, of 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 funding, I mean, get channeled to politically reliable people typically uh very famously um the mayor of Viktor orban's native village uh lorenz mesaros became the wealthiest man in hungary he and uh, his wife control over 100 different companies that have had stunning degree of success bidding for government contracts typically funded by by the eu you know to build roads to build uh you know, sanitation infrastructure, uh, municipal lighting, anything you can imagine that that, that sort of you know, governments, local or, or or central, tend to 
tend to invest in. Uh, and he was actually once asked what he owed his extraordinary economic success to, and he said it was uh, God, Luck, and Viktor Orban. Uh, and here, so you have stories like this throughout Hungary, and I think ultimately it's going to be this this extraordinary degree of corruption, which uh, again, like corruption is not unique to Hungary, it's not unique to these sort of entrenched entrenched political systems you see elsewhere, but 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 the sort of grotesque sort of magnitude of it uh, is, I think, going to be uh, Viktor Orban's ultimate undoing. The sort of lack of restraint on the on the on, on the part of the ruling class. And, and, and just sort of funneling money to, to, to their own pockets is, is something that I think, you know, even people who would agree with Orban on things like immigration and sort of, you know, social conservatism or, and, and, and whatnot, uh, just find increasingly off-putting, especially if they have to live within that system and if they sort of see how it's, how it's happening on a daily basis. So you mentioned there's an effort to get together a sort of united front of all the different opposition parties. And I think the theory being here that the system's so rigged that if you don't, if you can't get back into power and fix some of that, you're going to be locked out forever. Uh, so is there, for first of all, you think that's going to be relatively successful? And, and do they have a reform agenda for after that to try to make it so that you could have a, a more, more plurality in the, in the political system? So I think there's a decent chance of of this white front of opposition parties winning the next election. Uh, it really took many iterations for these parties to sort of learn the main lesson, which is that they have to work together in order to, to defeat Fidesz. And you know, Fidesz has an external funding machine and and and, and, and the ability to sort of really uh, put forward the right candidates in the right places and let the opposition cannibalize itself. Uh, so, so, so I think that, that that's a problem that's been sort of recognized and is being dealt with. And there is a decent chance that that, that the opposition will, will, will come out victorious from, from next year's elections. Uh, and I think the other, the, 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 the latter question that you ask, you know, whether there is a joint governing agenda for, for, for these very diverse opposition parties is is a much harder nut to crack, honestly. Um, unlike in the 1990s, where you had, uh, you know, instances of uh, you know, authoritarians trying to entrench themselves in places like Slovakia, where I'm originally from, uh, you know, back then there was this um, this sort of shared imperative of of joining the West, of joining the European Union, and joining NATO, and doing you know all sorts of right things in order to, to sort of meet the criteria for entry. Uh, compared to that period, I think uh, there is much less of a clarity, uh, intellectually speaking, ideologically speaking, on part of these opposition parties in terms of what needs to be done. And I think once they need to govern, once they are confronted with uh, really the sort of layers of sort of entrenchment that go much, much deeper than just the sort of highest echelons of of government that go like through the judiciary, uh, through the public administration, through media ownership, uh, I think it's going to be difficult. And, and already you see it with Orban uh, that he uh, seems to be investing into what is a sort of intellectual and ideological base that could enable him to make a political comeback after a few years. It's actually this whole outreach to American conservatives uh, which is driven by you know the government's funding machine by you know, throwing money at uh, various government connected think tanks and, and and universities or quasi universities. I mean it sort of creates a set of sort of institutions and sort of organizations that uh, are going to be impossible to just undo in one year. I'm not even sure it would be desirable to try to undo them uh, lest it. Uh, Further strengthens these cycles of, of 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 negative negative polarization, but but it's it's going to just place the opposition in a very advanced the future opposition I, I I mean into a very advantageous position once the new government arrives in power and happens to be rather clueless about what needs to be about what needs to be done. Well, and and that brings me to to what I think is is you know my interest in it you know from the American perspective our interest in it is. You have all these conservative intellectuals going over there, and and then there's Tucker Carlson. I don't think you call him an intellectual, but you know conservative conservative media figures going over there, and some of them very much fawning over the Hungarian model. 
And it looks like the lesson they've learned from this or the model they want to take from it is this sort of fantasy of if only our side could get its hands on state power and use it in the same way to entrench ourselves. If only we could, now I don't know that Orban took, created a whole university that's basically meant to be you know, massive government funding and meant to be a home for intellectuals who will you know, advocate his nationalist ideology. And their idea is if only we could get money to create, you know, to fund universities in America and think tanks in America, if only we could use the you know, government to uh, support our media organizations and, you know, make Tucker Carlson show that the, the only one that people have available to watch, if only we could do that, then we would have ensure this sort of um, uh, political dominance of the right in America. I mean, that, that seems to be the, the sort of the, the model that they're trying to take. I think that's that's right, and ultimately it ref it's, it says more about the self-styled conservative intellectual figures and, and and media media personalities in the West that it does about the Hungarian system. Uh, at this dinner with Viktor Orban, Dr. Carlson said very clearly that uh, the main virtue of, of 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 Orban's regime and of Orban himself is that he is being hated by the right people in the West, and. And I mean, you know, when I came of age, I was attracted to classical liberalism, to some strings within within modern conservatism, uh, and because of the underlying principles, because of the idea of individual freedom and responsibility, uh, importance of free enterprise, uh, of American leadership in the world, uh, and, and, and right now it looks like, uh, you know, this this broader movement has really just become a a vehicle for just you know negative emotions and and if 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 if, if not hatred actually it's, it's it's interesting somebody noted that on Twitter the extent to which you know somebody like J D Vance uses the term hatred in a positive way as if it were uh, you know something good that, that strikes me as sort of deeply un-American. Uh, and, he he and, was, as I remember, he was both. He's a Senate candidate in Ohio, and he was boasting about how much you know that that yes, we hate the right people. That's that's good about us, or one of his he or one, and one of his aides were, were were saying that. Yeah, so that's something that has always sort of been present in some ways in in the sort of blood and soil conservatisms of of, of the European continent, but but I always found it very alien to to the English speaking conservative classical liberal liberal traditions and. Uh, and so it's certainly not a welcome development from my perspective to sort of see uh, see Americans who and American conservatives who should know better to to sort of reach out to and and and, and sort of model themselves after after the example of, of of Hungarian aspiring authoritarians. It is also something that just like at, at a very sort of simple sort of surface level is 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 very odd to sort of square with the America first rhetoric, right? Like it was Donald Trump that that introduced this issue of China and the Chinese challenge into America's foreign policy conversation. And maybe he deserves you know some degree of credit for for bringing it to the forefront. But it's also true that that Viktor Orban is is the most reliable ally of China on on the European continent within the EU. I mean Hungary has systematically over and over vetoed any effort by the European Union to hold China accountable for its treatment of Uyghurs, for the crackdown in, in Hong Kong. Uh, Hungarian government very flatly said no to the Trump administration when, uh, when Pompeo was trying to, to get Central European government, governments to, uh, to ban Huawei from investing into, into 5G uh, networks in the region. Uh, Hungary got a uh, you know a loan from from China to build a railroad connection to Belgrade, uh, very ostentatiously to actually sort of facilitate economic integration with China. That makes it brings brings Hungary closer to the Greek ports through through which Chinese imports uh, come to Europe. And uh, most recently uh, this year, uh, it was announced that Fudan University, based in Shanghai, would build a campus in Hungary uh, with Chinese funding uh, with an amount exceeding the annual budget of all Hungarian public universities combined. Uh, and there was a massive popular outcry actually, and, and, and then the government backtracked a little, uh, but it just wasn't 
you know, it wasn't beneath uh, the Orban government to, you know, after having kicked out the George Soros founded Central European University to, to bring a Chinese, uh, you know, state, state backed state finance university uh, right to the, to the heart of Europe. So, so I just find these, these tensions very difficult to sort of navigate, negotiate. I'm not sure how, um, how, you know, pro Orban conservatives uh, do it exactly. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, that, that that's a big, uh, the, the big mystery we've been contending with here in America. Uh, those of us who are generally on the right who have worked for conservative publications basically saying what's going on. And, and the, the fundamental contradiction is, as you said, in the English, conservatism in the English speaking world has always meant, what are we conserving? Well, you're conserving the English system of government of law, or you're conserving the American system of law that was built on top of, uh, on, the, on the basis of the, the English tradition. So it's, you know, you're conservative, but you're conserving a liberal tradition, a classically liberal tradition. Unlike the sort of conservatism of the more European style of mainland or continental European style of conservatism, where it's, you know, blood and soil, it's looking to the past, it's nationalist, it's religious. And I think what we have is a, a crisis here in America on the conservative side of, do you stand for conserving the liberal order of the founding fathers, or do you stand for this blood and soil, you know, uh, uh, authority and, and religion uh, uh, style of, of conservatism? And that's really what's fragmenting things apart. But what struck me is the other big sort of contradiction or irony of this is what you were talking about, uh, uh, Orban being very close, uh, the Orban regime being very close to China. And also when we talk about this discontinuity of the system of, you know, that when, when the wall came down, when the communist systems were being taken apart, that Hungary made less of a transition in terms of its institutions, in terms of entrenching liberalism. Uh, to some extent, some people have said, I don't know if you would agree with this, but some people have said this isn't so much a, a DDoC democratization or a, 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 um, a backsliding from democratization, but it was never fully liberalized in the first place. Uh, it, it didn't quite go as far. And I think it's interesting that you have a sort of insufficiently reformed Soviet system <laughs> and you have a lot of conservatives saying, well, that we don't mind so much the system and all the things that haven't been reformed in the system so long as we get to control it. You know, as long as people like us, nationalist, conservative types, religious types, as long as we get to control those levers of power, then we're OK with it. So it's almost like the problem with the problem with the Soviet Union wasn't that there was a liberal regime, but that the wrong people were in control of it. I think that's right. Already in 1998, when uh, when when Orbán was leading his party Fidesz into into a, an electoral victory, he campaigned with this this slogan of what "Was it more than the change in government, less than change of regime?" And he promised, you know, wholesale sort of institutional reforms, new constitution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in the end, he didn't have enough votes in parliament to do that, and he got voted out in 2002. And then he came back in 2010 with a, with a vengeance in a way, uh, but again with this promise of completing, uh, completing the um, the transition that started in 90 in, in in the late 1980s. Already, actually, in the second half of the 1980s, Hungary had you know some opposition parties and some private property and some free enterprise. It was very different from from other other countries of the of the region. Uh, but but the other thing that, that that played into that was that with Orban was very successful in the 90s, in the noughties, in, in sort of connecting those residues of, 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 of the former communist regime with just, you know, mainline left liberalism as practiced, you know, in Western Europe. Uh, the sort of, there's no, nothing more effective, I think, in, 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 in Central Europe these days than, than the sort of neo-Marxist label, which is being put on, on everything, you know, from, from the actual sort of neo-Marxism to, to just, you know, <laughs> central right parties that that they don't like, they don't like, they don't like Fidesz, and 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 so, so he um, after the 2010 elections, uh, actually decided to, uh, to just present himself as as the enemy of liberalism writ large, and I think that includes classical liberalism as well. If you go and read his 2014 speech. Uh, in Baile Tushnat in, in, in Romania, where he does have a, this summer school every year, uh, you know, he, he sort of looks up to you know, Singapore, Turkey, and China 
as what he calls stars of international analysts, as opposed to liberal democracies of the of the West. Um, in 2011, uh, Hungary, I think, had its one of its sort of first high-level summits with China. He was already back then Orban praising uh, the Chinese Communist Party as you know an institution where work is the foundation, where where economic success does not come with fiddling with books, like 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 in the West. So so he uh, he was able to sort of create this. Um, is largely a straw man, this sort of idea of, of, of liberalism as encompassing everything from you know, free enterprise to cosmopolitanism to open borders to you know LGBTQ rights. Yeah, I, I, but, I, I don't know. I don't know if you have I don't know if you if you have drag queens in and if they have drag queens in Hungary, but I know that this is something that looms very large in the imagination of American conservatives, that this is like you know the the uh, the really outrageous thing that they try to connect everything to. Uh, I mean, funnily enough, I mean, you, you know, you had gender studies departments, I guess, in, at the universities. Uh, Fidesz government defunded those. I don't think life of ordinary Hungarians was ever like affected directly or indirectly by by the intellectual influence of 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 of, of, of these. I think it's you know, it's much less of an issue than and it sort of reflects the parochiality of American conservatives to think that the same battles are being fought with the same vigor. In, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Obviously, you had these divisive issues like you know, gay rights and, 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 and so forth. Uh, but, but still, he, uh, I mean, he created this sort of idea of you know, Hungary, Hungary's sort of traditional society being in mortal danger from, from these excesses of, of Western left liberalism. While in reality, you know, life in Hungary is threatened mostly by bad governance and corruption and lack of economic opportunity. I mean, you look at the sort of demographic trends, you had just hundreds of thousands of young Hungarians, well-educated, who have left the country, who live in the UK, who live in Germany, who, who live in Austria, um, in spite of efforts which have been praised in in sort of Western conservative circles, at, at sort of you know encouraging uh, uh, encouraging women to to have you know and people to have their larger families and 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 more children, like you know, like none of these efforts are really working if, if if people don't really see a future for themselves and their children in in Hungary. And and I think in as long as as this sort of kleptocratic entrenched system is in place. I don't think that's going to change, and 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 so if you want Hungary to be a successful society, and I, you know, have wish, wish only the best for, for 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 that country, I think it's reasonable to to wish for a for 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 a change in in, in the governing style at the very least. Yeah. So what you're saying is you don't think that uh, Viktor Orban is going to make Hungary great again? Certainly not. <laughs> uh, no. Uh... I also want to talk just a, a second or so for about the implications for the region, because, you know, Hungary is sort of a, a bellwether. You already have a very well entrenched sort of neo authoritarian model in Russia and that little belt of countries, the Visegrad countries and, and to the north and south of that are sort of the buffer zone from what between Western Europe and Russia. So there's a strong interest for for Western Europe in the U.S. to have those countries, you know, on the path to becoming free societies or, or becoming stable free societies. And that's turned out very well in the Baltic states, but mm -hmm. they're very small. <laughs> and um, it's had mixed success elsewhere. What do you think is the uh, the long term sort of implication of this different directions that places that 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 these different countries are going? I think on the one hand, uh, the. You know, perhaps exaggerated expectations that, that people might have had 20 years ago play a role in all this. So, so you know, the fact that you get rid of communist totalitarianism and that you put in place certain reforms, I, I don't think that's necessarily a guarantee of specific outcomes, politically speaking, or even culturally speaking. So, so I think we have to, on the one hand, we have to sort of learn to live with the differences that exist between different countries, not every Central European society is going to look like Southern California or, or Denmark. And, and I think actually Orban, uh, you know, part, part of sort of the, the sort of kernel of, of, of sort of truth in, in his campaigning and his political messaging is that uh, 
by nature, history, accident, uh, these societies are more culturally, socially conservative than, than parts of Western Europe or, or you know, coastal, coastal areas in, 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 in the United States. And, and the expectation that it should be sort of moving along the same trajectory as everybody else is, is just unrealistic. So I think there has to be a sort of appreciation of, of, of pluralism, if you will, in, 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 these, in these areas. And I think European Union, for example, has been doing a very poor job in distinguishing between basic democratic principles and rule of law on the one hand, and, and these broader liberal or progressive commitments to you know, gender equality, tolerance towards minorities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so on, on the one hand, that's, you know, that, that's part of the story that you know, these societies have different histories, different cultural experiences, et cetera, than, 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 than the West. Uh, the sort of presumption of sort of homogeneity and evolution towards the same ideal is, is, is not unrealistic. On the other hand, uh, there is a real problem, especially if you if you consider that, that these countries joined the EU, joined NATO, and then the democratic institutions and, and sort of foundations of rule of law, which many took for granted, started eroding. Um, the EU, in principle, should have mechanisms to stop that. There is the famous Article Seven in the in the Lisbon Treaty that should enable the EU to to push back whenever there is a country that is experiencing rule of law problems. The way uh, that structure is set up, however, makes it quite literally impossible for the EU to do anything because you need uh, a unanimous agreement of all other member states to put in place sanctions or restrict voting rights in the European Council or, or just do anything that would have that would have sort of real legal or political, political consequences. So once you have you know, more than one country with a rule of law problem, and, and right now uh, there probably are more than just, than just two in the European Union, that's, that's a no-go. Uh, the one place where, where, where Western Europe and, 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 and the EU could push back, I think is, you know, is, is the power of the purse. I mean, the, the sort of the extent to which European money matters and helps Orban and his party uh, should make it a no-brainer for the EU to, you know, at least protect its own financial interests in, in, in a place like Hungary, to make sure that money does not get stolen, does not go towards sort of bad, wrongful, uh, wrongful uses. Uh, and, and I think the EU has done a very poor job on that, on, on, on that front. And you know, so we can, we can talk about why. Uh, <laughs> But I think that that's the sort of the low hanging fruit that 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 I see in, in trying to in trying to, to to push back ultimately. Again, like these societies, you know, countries are different, societies are different. We should we should sort of learn to live with those differences. Uh, but for an entity like the EU or an alliance like NATO to function well and 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 and, and be sort of revitalized and, and and fit for purpose, I think there has to be a basic commitment to some sort of shared values and. Uh, and if there isn't an immune system in place that can can can, can fight back against against authoritarianism in in the midst of these of these organizations, I think I think the West has a problem. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I really appreciate your your uh, perspective on this because you know Americans are notorious for not wanting to look overseas. We have this giant country. We live all the way on the other side of an ocean in splendid isolation, and we 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 kind of have a tendency not to look outward. And when we do look outward, we tend to do so only when it selectively, when it sort of connects to somebody's domestic agenda, as is the case here. So I really appreciate the con the the uh, the context provided by, by somebody who's in who's from the region who who who's who's ha has some more firsthand, more nuanced uh, and, and more detailed context on this. So I really appreciate that. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. I'm Rob Trusinski with Symposium Magazine. My guest today has been Dalibor Rohak of the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, you can subscribe on YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast. And above all, you can read more at symposium.substack.com. Thank you for joining the conversation.